Welcome, everyone, to DEI After Five, the show that focuses on topics across diversity, equity, and inclusion with some of the brightest minds in the industry. Here's your hostess, inclusive culture curator and coach, Sasha Thompson. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of DEI After Five. Okay, so let me share um, a little bit of background for you. When I first started the equity equation some years ago, one of my missions, one of my goals was to make sure that other women of color, Black women, um, were not going through the same things that I was going through when I was in a corporate space. And so I started doing a lot of coaching around supporting women of color um, in the workplace. Fast forward, um, what I realized in doing that was it doesn't really make a lot of sense to, to continue doing that work if the, the situation, the environment isn't changing as well. And so I, I did that pivot. But one of the aspects of that work, continuing to support women of color in the workplace is still very near and dear to my heart. And I still do some of that work um, with the equity equation. But today I am talking to two guests who have been doing this work for several years, really making sure that women of color um, have the support, have the guidance, have what they need in order to be successful in the workplace. And so today we're speaking with Vanity Jenkins and Rachel Vicente, two women who are powerhouses in this space. So welcome, 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 Vanity and Rachel. Just went brain just closed for a second. How are you doing today? Doing well. Thank you so much for having us, Sasha. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So, Vanity, I want to um, start with you and just talk a little bit about how you got into this work and a little bit about the program. And then Rachel will kind of jump over to you. Sure. Um, so similar to you, um, I started my career in the nonprofit sector and really started leading DEI initiatives at a number of, in a number of nonprofit spaces. From there, really wanted to um, e expand my impact and wanted to do DEI work um, alongside organizations that really wanted to make uh, monumental shifts in how they were operating, how they were thinking about culture, how they were supporting women of color. And so launched my own consulting company. Um, from there, similar to you again, um, I started off as an executive coach. And so really coaching predominantly women of color. I did coach, um, you know, some white folks and some men as well, but predominantly women of color and um, started chit chatting with Rachel about some trends that we were seeing with women of color in particular and how they were experiencing the workplace in particular, how a lot of leadership development was not geared towards women of color's um, inherent strengths. A lot of times when um, you, know, you go into a leadership development program, it essentially is teaching you how to think and act and uh, be a cisgender white man, right? Um, and so Rachel and I really wanted to deconstruct that and how we thought about leadership development. I love it, I love it. Rachel. Yeah, thanks. Um, when I think about my own journey, I start way back um, in my work as um, a child. So when I was young, I actually was uh, facilitating conversations around uh, basically racism and anti-Semitism um, as a middle schooler to elementary school student. So I was mm -hmm. always really curious about you know, what are the things that allow for people to be themselves, right? Like, I think 10, 11, 12 year old Rachel would say like, just be you, right? Like, what are the things that allow kids to be themselves? Um, obviously now we would use that language as like, what are the things that allow for people to be their authentic selves? Mm -hmm. And so really young, I had this like deep curiosity around that question. How and who are the people who are allowed to be their authentic selves. And so that type of question had carried me 
um, throughout my life and then into my career, similar to um, you all as a nonprofit executive. Um, and the thing was, I was answering those questions around like, there are mostly the people that are in power, right? So again, the cisgender white man, um, the people that hold power and their whiteness and their ability status and, right, and their gender, all of those things. And so um, I really thought critically about what is kind of my role in this and really centering around intersectionality. Because mm. also being a woman of color, I experienced women of color having a vastly different experience. And so my prioritization in launching my business from a nonprofit exec um, was centered around how can I support companies to create spaces where particularly women of color can thrive? Because if we plan for women of color thriving, we're planning for all the other people to be able to thrive. And so like really this idea of planning for the margins. And so mm -hmm. we already know we'll talk a lot about what are some of the reasons why that happens. Um, and then, yeah, in my partnership with Vanity, we um, work together to uh, create a fellowship experience, a particular leadership development experience for women of color called Authentically Me to really solve a gap that we were noticing nationally around leadership development programs, right? That there's not still, right? There's still not high quality, mm -hmm. unique and tailored professional development for women of color that is centered in their authenticity. And so that is what we set out to um, do and what we are setting out to accomplish. I, you know, there's so much alignment with what you all are saying and have experienced and, and what I've seen and, you know, experienced. And we chatted earlier around, you know, I have a similar partnership working with, you know, women in, in the similar space because we saw the same gaps. And so it's, it's so important that I think people realize these gaps are there. Like they're not imagined. They're not just, I don't want to say, you know, just circumstance like, oh yeah, you know, that there's this thing over there. Yes. It's this thing over there. And what are you doing to kind of close that gap? Um, you know, one of the things I said at the top, which I thought was so, which is kind of what helped me kind of reshape how I look at this work and, and doing this business is for so many organizations, they'll throw women of color into these coaching programs or say, you need to get coaching as if they are a problem to be fixed. And what I started quickly realizing was there may be some challenges right? And, and how we show up. And not that it's not us being authentic. It's because we are trying to fit into this box that was not meant for us, for sure. right? And so we're not showing up in the ways that the organization wants us to show up because it's inauthentic to who we are. So there's that piece of it. But then it's the environment continues to be toxic. The environment continues to not be prepared. The, you know, the environment is not changing. And so you're asking women of color in particular to I, contort. <laughs> this is like, I just it can visualizing like a gymnast just contorting their body to create this entity that is so much less of who we are. And then we truly get penalized for it on the other end of the other side of it. Mm -hmm. So you know, that was a whole long way of asking the question, you know, like, so you all have been doing this for some time. Um, and, you know, again, we've, we've talked about some of those disparities, but what have you specifically seen um, as some of those challenges that made you all raise your hands and say, you know what, no, we need to step in and do something? Sure. Um, I can start off. I think one of the things to um, how you frame the question Every fellowship at the end, we have women who share, thank you so much for this space because now I know I'm not crazy. You know, mm. thank you so much for this space where I can talk to other women of color who are experiencing this. And I know that it's not an isolated issue or that, you know, I am the only problem and I'm just not working hard enough or, you know, I'm just not fitting into this um this box where I can't show up and I can't, 
uh, find success in this atmosphere or in this environment. So I think that that's definitely part of it. Um, I think another part of it is so many of our systems are still designed under the umbrella of white supremacy culture, right? And so um, I'm sure folks who listen to this podcast are familiar with um, the aspects of white supremacy culture, but those really show up in the workplace very, very often in how we do things. You know, one of the things that Rachel and I often talk about is um, worship of the written word, right? And so a lot of um, cultures of communities of color, we come from or oral traditions, right? And so mm -hmm. if I want to share an update with my manager in a voice memo, or if I want to share an update with my manager, um, you know, through video or through another form, that should be okay as long as I am still doing what I need to do. However, um, oftentimes the person who knows how to use Excel and create all of these beautiful um, charts and spreadsheets is seen as more valuable, even if the work that they're actually putting into that document is not more detailed or is not more comprehensive than what I might have shared in a voice note. But because we believe that, um, you know, writing is a higher order functioning skill or we believe that writing is um, more important than oral traditions, that person would get more value or that person would be more likely to be promoted as having the skills that we're looking for at whatever said organization instead of um, becoming more expansive and thinking about what do I actually need my employees to do? What are the actual goals on this team? And as long as a person is reaching those goals, there should be lots of different ways that people can um, show up and express themselves. And I think that's one of the um, one of the biggest challenges is that we have such a narrow view and vision of what work is, of what good work is. Yeah. And, you know, if Sasha did it this way, then you need to do it that way. Mm -hmm. And if Rachel did it this way, then you need to be exactly like Rachel. And, you know, that takes away, that stifles creativity, that doesn't allow for um, multifaceted, comprehensive, complex solutions to things. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we peel back the layers of that, um, we often find that white supremacy culture is at the root of why um, people are having a negative experience. And so we focus a lot on unpacking white supremacy culture in our cohort. And again, not only for white folks, because people of color internalize white supremacy culture. Absolutely. As well. so we have to unpack the things that we have learned about what we place value on, because we've also grown up in this system as well. Yeah. You know, as you're talking, what I'm thinking through, and I do a lot of work around kind of like psychological safety. Mm -hmm. And part of that is between stages two and three. So stage two is learner safety, right? How how do I learn? How do you allow me to learn the nuances of the work, the environment, you know, all of these things? And then stage three is contributor safety, right? How can I show my value? And one of the biggest mistakes that I think most organizations do is exactly what you spoke about. It's, I'm going to create this environment where you can learn, you can go to classes, go to cons, you know, conferences, do all of these things, but then they come back to, well, we've always done it this way. Mm -hmm. Or I need you to do it like in this way. And I'm like, you just created this environment where people can learn and they can grow and they can do things in a way that are that's healthy for them, or they can take information in in a way that is healthy for them, but then you're dictating how they share that information, which may not be aligned with who they are or how they express themselves. And so that's, that's exactly what I was envisioning when you used that example, because I came from an environment where everything was a doc. Everything was a doc. Are you going to write a one pager for this? Are you going to write a two pager for this? Are you going to write a six pager? for? And I was just like, can I just tell you what I need to tell you? Mm -hmm. Can I just say, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm so excited about this idea. The process of me having to put that down into six pages. I was just like, mm -hmm. I was about to say something bad. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I no, <laughs> I'm not going to give you my idea. I'm going to hold on to this because 
you're just gonna it's gonna suck the life out of me to to have to think of it in this way. So you know, I appreciate you using that example because it is a very tactical way that we we can't show up as our authentic selves because of the environment mm -hmm. that we're a part of. Rachel, tell me um, one of the things that you've really been able to push folks on because um, Vanity talked about, you know, how we also internalize white supremacy, even as women of color. And mm -hmm. so what were some of like the ahas that some of the folks that have gone through, some of your fellows have gone through in this process? Yeah. So I think one of our very first sessions is centering around what are your values and who are you at the core? And the thing that we really hit home for people is that being a values driven leader, right? So making decisions about your values is oftentimes related to you being an authentic leader and being a fulfilled leader. And so we spend a lot of time really peeling back for people what are the moments that they've been inauthentic? What are the moments that they have been authentic? And how has their values really showed up into the space? And what they will find, a lot of aha moments is that they're really interrogating their current workplace and saying, wow, I am abiding by the values of my institution. So a concrete example um, is if an organization's value is like prestige or like quantity or things, and your value is just like, I really love teamwork or like being in community or community, right? We'll talk a lot about how those two could be in tension with each other and how they show up in tension, right? And then when we peel back prestige as a company or organizational value, it's often rooted in whiteness, which is bigger is better, right? Mm -hmm. To seem or deem more successful, you have to continue to grow. And so we're making a lot of connections around who are they and who do they want to be as a leader? How is your current environment really fostering that or not fostering that? And what are the systemic barriers that are contributing to that experience? And so that is really important as an aha moment where people are like, oh my gosh, I am so stressed out at work because I'm in misalignment of my values every mm -hmm. single day, right? And so they are really leaving empowered saying, the next place I work at, I have clarity about what I'm going to look for and yep. evidence around something being values-based. And so I think that's one aha moment that they have. Similar to Vanity, like we, when we're, you know, marketing our fellowship, we literally say like, we're, if you are looking for being in community with like-minded women of color, right? So that is often a really common one that they're looking for. Like another one is building confidence and clarity, right? Again, mm -hmm. an example of how we really demonstrate that. We hear consistently about the value of just being in community. So Absolutely. one person's aha might be like, oh my goodness, I didn't even realize that, or I didn't even make that connection around X, Y, Z. And so there, um, our session around white supremacy culture and internalized racial oppression is by far where many of their aha moments are because we're building shared language and shared understanding to say things like, hey, one of the characteristics of internalized racial oppression is scarcity. It's competition. Yep. It's oppression yep. Olympics. And they're able to say, wow, here is how I embody that in my work. Here is how others embody that in my work. And here is why this culture, again, is not set up for me. And so mm -hmm. it takes from a really, it moves our women of color and our, their experience from a um, you know, really personalizing it to step back and say, here is how the systems are setting up me and my leadership experience. And so again, it's shifting from a super disempowering mindset to a really empowering one to say, I have agency to engage in this way. I have agency to be at another place, be in a new role. And so that's the beauty of it is that really giving people, we always say like, you have the choice 
It's about you understanding what are the consequences associated with multiple of the choices. And so um, it's beautiful to be able to share, to see and to share. But those are some of the aha moments that I think are really connected to some of the barriers Vanity talked about. Yeah. You know, as you were talking, what um, one of the most common aspects of white supremacy culture that shows up is rugged individualism. Oh. Right. And oh. <laughs> did I strike a nerve? Um, and so, you know, that's the, and you, you think back and I'm about to tell my age, but when you would see like the Marlboro man, or you would see like going out on the frontier and, you know, that has now worked its way into the corporate space of a mindset of I have to do this on my own. I have to journey out on my own and do this. And no one else is going to help me or be a part of this journey, even though they are. And, you know, and it's like, you see how this, I will step on people in order to get to this pinnacle, right? Because I did it on my own. I pulled myself up from my bootstraps in order to do this. Counterbalance that with, we come from a, a place of community. We come from a place of, you know, helping each other and supporting each other and giving each other what you need in order to be successful. And if I don't have, you have because, you know, I have because you have, yeah. right? Like there, that's a very different mindset. And so to come from culturally a space of sharing and caring and nurturing to one that is the opposite of that, makes it very difficult. And so that's that cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. <laughs> that constantly happens within the workplace. And so, you know, what you all, what you're talking about or what you're sharing is that distress that we go through culturally because we are told rugged individualism. Mm -hmm. We're told you have to do this on your own. We are told we need to get X number of degrees in order mm -hmm. to be seen as valuable. Mm -hmm. Right, we're told we have to go through this checklist. The checklist itself is white supremacy culture. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And so it's how do you pivot out of that? And yeah. that is that's the work. Yeah. And that is what's difficult. Um, and so you know, one of the things that I said at the top was it's so important to do this work because whew, we have a lot to unpack within ourselves. Mm -hmm. But then you have organizations that are remaining the same, right? Mm -hmm. They still have their checklist. They're still doing all of the things that are causing harm, um, particularly for women of color. And so how do you all work with women to help them get back into those types of situations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I want to um, share a couple of things in response to that question. The mm -hmm. first is, so we have a, a whole session about um, playing the game, right? Um, because at some point or another, women of color are, are often told that we have to play the game. Um, and oftentimes that advice comes from other people of color, whether they are our mentors, whether they're our parents, whether they are, you know, our managers or people who we respect. And so we start to unpack where that notion of playing the game comes from. And we really get deep into what are you actually saying when someone is telling you to play the game? Mm -hmm. uh, what are they actually coaching you around? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, it, oftentimes it's respectability politics. It is rugged individualism. It is essentially how to... Um, show up as close to white supremacy culture as possible as you can in that body as a woman of color, right? Um, and so we start to unpack where those messages have come from. When have you played the game? And what did you lose? Um, mm. I'll often talk mm. about- um, Can we pause on that part? <laughs> <laughs> Not just playing the game, but what did you lose? Because mm -hmm. yes. it is not a win-win. Yes, yes. Okay, sorry. That that just we found a lot on our bodies because our bodies often tell us when we are doing something that is out of alignment. And so mm -hmm. sometimes it shows up as high blood pressure. Sometimes mm -hmm. it shows up as stress. Sometimes it shows up 
physiologically in your body when you are behaving in a way that is out of alignment because of advice that someone else gave you, right? Um, and so we start to help women really sit with that and understand that, you know, we all have choices and sometimes it doesn't feel like we have choices. Sometimes those choices are weighted. Um, one of the other things that Rachel and I talk about is, you know, I am a single mom um, and Rachel is not a caregiver. And so I didn't go full time in my business until I was three years in, whereas Rachel was able to go full time in her business as soon as she opened it. And that is because of different choice points that we had because of who we are individually. Right. And so we don't say like, hey, you can go and be authentic tomorrow. Right. We don't set people up with that notion, but we want to support them and remind them that you do have choices and you can plan accordingly because of those choices that you have. And so I think it's critically important for women of color to really understand that, you know, we're never gonna tell someone, leave your job, right? Um, that's a choice that you have to make. And we say that lots of times in our fellowship, but throughout this process, you may come to realize that you are not in alignment with your current workplace. Now, what does that mean? Um, you know, how do you then go and find a job where you are more aligned? How do you decide what your next steps should be or what you want to do next? Um, and we really let folks grapple with those questions and we support them throughout the way, of course. Um, and, you know, Rachel and I are, are also coaches. And so um, we also coach women who are in those situations sometimes. But I think one of the things that is really important for us to consider is how are we creating spaces where authentic where authenticity is not only accepted, but where it's valued, mm -hmm. right? And I think so many times organizations miss out on um, their full potential because they are stifling the creativity, the brilliance, the um, what could be at their organization because they are so used to having things in a straight and narrow way. You know, mm -hmm. you have to follow A, then B, then C instead of thinking about, well, if this is our goal, it doesn't matter how we get there as long as we reach our goal. And so we like to push organizations as well to think about, okay, you've had some women um, join this fellowship. How are you going to support them once they are back? They might be asking these types of questions. Um, and I mm -hmm. think the, the best example of that is we've actually done the fellowship for um, organizations. So organizations were able to have a set number of their women of color participate as long as there were no management lines because we do talk a lot about power in the fellowship. Yeah. Um, and then we were able to really set them up with going back to their organization and changing those systems and structures and processes so that it could be a more conducive atmosphere to authenticity. I love that. Sasha, I can I add one, one additional thing? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that I want to name that I think is super important, and Vanity touched on it, and I think it's just really, want to be really clear for people that are listening. Um, one, of, I'm a healing-centered executive coach, and we talk a lot about, as Vanity shared, our body. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I believe is a misunderstanding or misprioritization is that your success is not more important than your body's health and wellness. Woo. Say it again for so, the people in the back. <laughs> so your success is not more important than your body's, your mental health and wellness. And why I'm saying that is because we have so many women of color that talk about their view of success really grounded in, again, more bigger is better, these titles, are, and they are sacrificing. And it's literally a sacrifice of their mental and well-being to get there. And I say, like, how are you going to be a CEO when you're dead? How are you like it? And, and, People, we laugh about it, but when Van and I talk about our own experiences in corporate America, where I was seeing a neurologist, I was experiencing so much stress physiologically because of work. And I'm like, ma'am, I was like, girl, I'm over here at the doctor. Falling apart. <laughs> Falling apart. <laughs> for, for chasing and living into somebody else's dream, right? Mm -hmm. A company's goals. 
And the whole women of color are just right. And I'm thinking about our intersectionalities of both women and also people of color. We are extreme caregivers and we are so we want to do well and we want to be good for people. We want to show for people. But we're often pouring from empty cups. We're often not even realizing the cups are empty. And so one of the things I think is super important, and this is for organizations, and this is what we talk about when we talk to white women, men of color, white white men that are supporting women of color, is that our physical and mental well-being is critical to yeah. us being able to thrive in an environment. Yeah. And for women of color to really say, cool, I, own, I can be, you know, the manager director of XYZ, but if the cost is that my I'm burnt out, I'm super stressed all the time, I'm not a great friend, parent, you know, et cetera, et cetera, then really what is that worth? And that's why I think when Vanny said, like, we're, what are we losing? Yeah. We have to really think deeply about our mental well-being, our physical well-being is the most important thing for us, the most important thing. So for us, we define success as how are we well first and then thinking about our professional life second. And so that's just one thing I just wanted to hit like home because when we think about organizations doing the work the same way, it's because they think about company goals first people's well-being second. Mm -hmm. And you, I'm so glad that you pointed that out um, and why I was having a little church sermon in my head because <laughs> it's, it's just so much of what you're saying is a huge part of why I do the work that I do in the way that I do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, saying in corporate space, I was rushed to the ER three times because of, of um, gastrointestinal issues and ulcers and hair falling out, like all of these things were happening. And I was just like, okay, something's got to give yes. and it's not going to be me. Well, like amen. this is non-negotiable. So I have to shift and change how I I operate in this space. And one of the things, you know, one of the reasons why, and we're going to get to it in a few minutes, I asked the question to every single one of my guests, of, you know, how do you fill your cup? What are the things that you do to take care of yourself is because it is so important. It's because I want that to be top of mind for people, because if you're not thinking about that, and like you said, if you're giving from an empty cup, what are you really giving? Mm -hmm. Right. And so like, how do you shift that so that I'm giving from my overflow? I'm filling my cup so much so that I'm giving you from my overflow and you're still getting greatness. Mm -hmm. That's a different mindset. Yes. And so, you know, I, I appreciate the work that you all are doing because it, it, it takes a shift. And, you know, as I said at the top, I shifted some of my business to working with the organizations because I'm like, I got to make sure that the body is right before I try to transition mm -hmm. this organ in here because mm -hmm. I don't want this body to reject this organ, mm -hmm. right? And so one of the questions that I always talk to leaders about, or not questions, one of the things that I make them think about is when folks on your team have ideas or you're saying, you know, brainstorming, I'm like, let them share their ideas first. Because mm -hmm. you're probably one of going to get ideas you didn't even think about. You're going to see how people operate in their own authentic way. If this is, if you've created a space and environment where it's safe to do this, right? And you get to see, okay, let me tap into the beauty of this idea or let me encourage this person in this other way. You show up as a leader very differently. Mm -hmm. And so when I do that work, it's so that when you all have done some work, you're now dealing with the leader that knows how to deal with a woman of color who's come back from one of these sessions feeling more of authentic and aligned with who they are. And they're not gonna be threatened. For sure. Because that. mm -hmm. that's the part that I know I went through when company paid for me to go through a leadership experience. And I came back like, listen, I know I'm the shit. <laughs> I know that I'm great. Right. <laughs> and however, that was a threat mm -hmm. to the leader. Yep. Right. 
which then caused a worse situation. Mm -hmm. So I, I love the work that you all are doing. And I love that you all are having that pushback with those organizations and saying, what are you doing to now support this? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that is so important. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to do my, my question then, right? My pivot. Like, what are the things that you all do to fill your cups? All right, Vanny, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, well, I am blessed to have really, really amazing friends who um, check on me and make sure that I am filling my cup because I am that woman that you were talking about, Sasha, who will give and give and give and give and give until I don't have anything left. Um, and so oftentimes they will make sure everything from, you know, make sure I'm drinking my water every day, make sure um, I'm going on walks to also making sure that I am really authentically celebrating and having um, time for myself. I'm an introvert. And so um, sometimes that means they pick up my daughter for me so that I can just have a quiet house with no lights on, no TV, nothing, just me and my bathtub and a glass of wine. Um, so they'll pick my daughter up and take her out. Um, she loves being around adults anyway as an only child. So she, you know, always gets to do something fun. And, you know, I have to have folks that I trust take her. So that is something um, that I definitely do. I love to read uh, romance novels when I am not reading things for work. So I do that. Um, and then I try to be active. You know, Rachel and I talked mm -hmm. about the body and it is really important to make sure that you are um, moving your body in whatever way feels comfortable to you. For me, sometimes that looks like taking a ballet class. I used to do ballet as a child. Um, oh, wonderful. So yeah, sometimes I'll go and do an adult ballet class. Um, I do try to be in nature. And so sometimes that means, you know, walking outside or taking a hike outside, things like that. But um, it really, really is critically important to take care of yourself. Um, and I know people say that all the time, but I was one of those people who ignored it for a while. And um, as we've all shared, I saw the physiological impacts of that. And so really mm -hmm. want to just put another cherry, another, you know, exclamation point. Um, please, 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 women of color, especially, please find time every day to do something for yourself, even if it's five minutes of meditation, um, affirmations, do something for yourself every day. Um, it was so great to hear. Um, obviously, I get to work so closely with Vanity, but to, to hear what the ways that fill her cup are also just continuing to be inspiring to me. Yeah, when I think about filling my cup, um, I am a big, you know, movement is medicine. Um, and so I live in Miami and I get to be in Sunny weather very, very often, most of the time, very blessed for that. And, and so some of that can just be like, I know based on what my body is telling me, just having a lot of body recognition, um, whether or not it's going to be a run, a, a, you know, a run at the lake or, you know, or, you know, the intercoastal or just a walk, right. Or I'm going to do some yoga or I'm going to, you know, meet up with my trainer. And so for me, it's, literally thinking about how am I moving some of this energy out, you know, out of my body to the universe, mm -hmm. the atmosphere. So I like literally visualize some of that. Um, and I'm a huge decompressor. So I'm a, um, the youngest of five. I was in a very busy environment growing up and I live by myself and, and I do a lot of executive coaching and leadership development. Right. And so I have to think about you know, how am I taking people's, you know, energy, how they're feeling? And so I have a pretty strict um, self-soothing regimen. And so every day, basically between about like three and six, I am like either um, taking a nap, um, reading, mm. uh, resting, like literally just laying down. And I don't answer any phone calls. Mm. it's a way for me to give myself actually an intellectual break. Um, I started this process um, in 2020. So, um, you know, after experiencing a lot of, of my own health challenges and my therapist was like, yo, you need, like you are, everyone's going, reaching out to you. Like you need to create some healthy boundaries for yourself. And so that like just quiet decompression time is so critical. And so, 
Um, I think it's really, for me, thinking about filling my cup as a practice, right? Some days I'm really not great at it and just giving myself grace and say like, all right, today we're going to do better um, and just figure out what works for you. Some people are like a long shower at the end of the day, right? Um, it's really personal. And so that is what I do um, to fill my cup um, and just be in you know community with people as well. I love it. I love it. A little jealous of the weather. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I, um, it is, we, uh, receive, I think it's like 75% sunny days every day. I mean, it is a, I lived in Chicago and in Boston. And so total opposite. And total. My, my feelings about life was also very different. <laughs> so. Yeah, I love it. All right. So Rachel, I'll start with you. If people want to get in contact with you, what is the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So you can um, go to my website. It's rachelvicente.com. You can also follow me on Instagram, um, rachelvicente underscore. Um, you can find me Rachel Vicente on other social media platforms as well. And so that is how you can get in contact with me and would love to connect with anyone that's interested. Wonderful. Vanity, how would folks get in contact with you? Sure. Um, so you can uh, go to my website, which is shiftedconsulting.com. You can also follow me on uh, social media at Shifted Consulting. Um, that's on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. I am not on Twitter or X, whatever it's called now. I can't keep up. <laughs> but anywhere else, you can find me um, at Shifted Consulting. Wonderful. Ladies, thank you both so much for spending this time with us. I think that there are so many pieces of information that you shared that women of color will walk away kind of thinking about um, and, and questioning themselves on how they're showing up and the support that they need. Um, but then also organizations and leaders that are listening that have women of color on their teams and something for them to be at least cognizant of as they are working toward being more inclusive leaders sure. um, and being mindful of kind of the, the challenges that are taking place. So thank you both for, for being here with us today. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for watching this week's episode of DEI After Five. As always, you can tune in on YouTube or any, um, any podcast platform where you can find us every Tuesday at 5.15 p.m. Eastern. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, have a good one.